Now, we want to take some learnings from that. Um, as a retailer, what is your thinking on capital? And when you had to, when, you know, you, when you were on your acquisition street, you, you were deploying capital, you were deploying retail, uh, retail earnings to, to do those acquisitions. Yeah. So where was it coming from? And, and how do you think of capital as a retailer? As a retail banker or as a retailer? So this is where we start seeing the dual personality. Yes, as a retailer, you don't need a lot of capital uh, because it generates funds by its, it generates a cash flow by itself, and the margins in the retail is very different. But at the end of the day, I mean the ROE is very different. Uh, while in the bank, you have to bring in more capital, whether it is retail banking or other types of banking. So as the as the loan uh, book uh, as the loan book grows, you have to put in more capital. Um, so we're uh, we're also looking into that because to grow the bank, you have to put in more capital. Right. So how do you, as a retailer, uh, reconcile that inside yourself? Because you must be, um, you know, against this whole notion of so much capital in a business. It's two different business. We have to see it differently because not um, uh, not everything can be like retail, where you don't need a lot of capital. And, but retail is also a very difficult uh, business, so we have no choice but to go elsewhere. As a retailer, how do you think of productization? When you look at something to sell, um, um, how do you think, like in, in this audience today and, and uh, in retail banking today, there's a lot of talk of uh, wealth management as the next big thing. Um, and banks are going into bundling products, uh, uh, you know, trying to hmm. look at it from a customer profitability point of view and so on. But as a retailer, um, what is productization to a retailer? Uh, I guess we first look into who is our target market, you know, before we put in the products, rather than products first and look for the market. We look into the market, uh, develop the products, you know, whether it's merchandise or whatever, uh, for, to get those target market. And then after that is to really give a lot of services to increase the size of the, their wallets. So it's always very customer focused. And so as a retail banker, at which point do you get to a point where you say you're over servicing a customer? There's not, never, never over servicing uh, unless the cost becomes much higher, you know. Um, we are always looking into the next uh, into the next business. So over servicing is an investment for the next business. Right, but in retail, the customer doesn't really pay you for the service because he is price conscious. No, but if there is a, such a thing as uh, uh, as a comfort level, and I, I won't say the trust, but comfort level, and also the uh, propensity to come back for the next trip. So we are, any over service is, uh, uh, is an investment for the next trip. As a traditional retailer, you build malls, and malls are physical infrastructure. In a number of industries, um, um, uh, traditional retail businesses, whether it's Walmart or um, um, you know, big supermarket stores and so on, um, and I'm just thinking of institutions that were almost obliterated by the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that um, customers get the information and get the access to the products as quickly as they can. In fact, the business that I thought uh, transformed itself very well was Lego, the, yes. the, um, the, the Scandinavian uh, toy manufacturer, um, because Lego is also physical, like, mm. like your malls. Um, and today, kids are playing electronic stuff, and so the, making that transition was a huge uh, story for them, basically. How are you dealing with that transition and what's, the, you know, what's your story in dealing with online? On the internet banking, for us it's more of a, an increased business and also a way to assure that we still have that, that customer that will not go to a brick and mortar uh, area. No? So um, for, we, you know, uh, customers are still human beings and they need that social interaction. So uh, while a lot of them will gradually go into 
uh, into the internet for their purchases, for uh, you know, even just for comparison of prices. Uh, there are still a lot who wants to go to a store to experience and if you are stressed you would like to go to a place where there are a lot of people that can make you forget your stress and one of the best stress therapy is shopping <laughs> yeah. so um, so there's still that human interactions that uh, that all of us needs good thing that we are not uh, robotic anymore I mean uh, uh, we're not robotic yet uh, so so we are looking into that aspect. And even in the retail banking, um, I mean in the banking area, our cost is high. Our cost of uh, customer service is quite high. But that is what the customer expects from us, especially in the Philippines. The uh, Philippines is one where we really interact socially a lot. Right. Um, the Philippines is also a country with 19 million people. And increasing. And increasing. How do you think about customer data, customer information, um, you know, what you're learning in terms of transaction? Do you pour over trends in that, in that sense or do you go by instinct? In, uh, in different, we, we, do it, uh, we do the customer data in different areas. You know, so it is, not, uh, it is not all homogeneous. We do have the data. Um, you're talking about your retail business or your bank? Both. Business? Both in the retail business, we do it from the, uh, from the reward cards. Uh, we also have reward cards in the banking area. And so we do it also, we, we do have some data on that. Um, as the chairman of your respective businesses, when your eye falls on the balance sheet of your retail business, what are the top line numbers that you look at? And when your eye falls on the balance sheet of your um, banking business, what are the top line numbers that you pay attention to very quickly? I guess, like all of us, it's always the top and the bottom lines that we look into. And then later on, it's more of uh, how much, uh, uh, it, it's usually the top line because we want to know how much, business, how much customers we have. And that is very important to us. You know, I mean, maybe we don't, we look into the top line more than the bottom line because uh, we're always looking into the future business. And the top line always shows the, the, you know, I mean, it gives you a gauge of how, how much customers you have. At this point, I'd like to open this conversation to all of us. Um, is there questions that you'd like to be able to ask? Yes. They say we are uh, all operators in this room. Um, so in your acquisition, there are in, in our industry, there are many failures in bank consolidation of people getting together. Uh, there are also a few good examples, and you are one of them. So we understand that in your acquisition, you were, I would say, the financial part, which was buying shares, that's one thing. But how did you put these, how did you put all these organizations together? What were the key drivers? Because you did have in many successful acquisitions, usually there was a strong bank which could wait on a weaker one. And we have two good examples here in Singapore. Um, in your case, you didn't have that, that uh, organization which could wait on another organization. So how did you combine all the elements? What, what, was the, what were the driving forces? And also in the Philippines, you, don't, you cannot... Um, uh, um, staff attrition is not something that no, uh, you deal with straight, with straight all Yeah, the When uh, we, we, we made a decision at the time that we are not going into attrition because I know I've read a lot that, pe that banks are, are uh, join up because they will be able to reduce the cost. But as I was, uh, as our earlier conversation, what is more important uh, for us is the top line, you know, rather than the bottom line. So what we do is to preserve the top line for the three, uh, for the three banks. And uh, by preserving the top lines, you cannot, you cannot reduce the people immediately. So what we do, we absorb everyone, merge them. And I know that the morale is, uh, is, is one of the things that uh, uh, will be affected. So what we did is we have a physical renovations of our branches to say that we are right now just one bank, the BDO bank. Um, our group was able to finish it, I think, in one year, uh, about 600-something branches at the time. Uh, it was a, 
uh, breakneck speed. And then the other one was um, we renovated the, the, uh, the, their working area because they have been neglected also for some time. So we know that we cannot train all of them at the same time. We have, uh, at that time, we have about 15,000 people. We could not, we, so what we did is we renovated their area and with the new area, it looks like it's a new beginning. So they are happy with their, uh, with their workplace and we have not really done much of, we, well, of course we have done some trainings, but we know that we couldn't reach everyone. So, but with the renovations in about a year time, we renovate our head office and wherever, wherever they are, wherever the other satellite offices. And uh, maybe about two years. Uh, so with, with that, they know changes are coming in. So it's a psychological thing. We spend a lot on the renovations, but it's the same as spending it on training and hoping that we reach everyone or uh, raising the morale of the people and say, this is a new beginning and let's, um, so we'll have to have a new attitude. That, that approach that you have, you know, starting with the focus of the top line, did cost you because uh, for a number of years, in fact, we were evaluating you, uh, your cost structure was way too high. Yes, because we did not, uh, we are friendly to the group and I mean friendly to our organizations and our rank and file, we're friendly to the union, so we ask the union also to help us put this together. And we know that uh, when we grow, we would be needing these people anyway. Of course, there's always a certain percentage that are not, uh, may not be the desired people, but we thought we'll just set, we will handle that later. Now, so in preserving the, the top line, we went out, we asked our people to go out and assure our customer that we are not going to reduce their credit line. We took that risk because we know that eventually it will have to go into another review. But at that time, we assured our clients that this will be the same people that you'll be working with and we are not cutting down on your credit line, be it in any of the three banks, it's going to be uh, additive. So, uh, so we so we work on so the customers are are calm. Our uh, our peop, our organizations people are calm because they know they will not lose their job. Customer, I mean uh, the clients, they will not be, they will not have to look for other banks. And um, with that, in a calmer environment, and then it's easier to work. Um, I guess we should end the conversation with the one last question, which is, what's the future is going to hold? What, what's in the back of your mind in terms of things to do? There, there are still quite a lot, um, it, uh, even in the banking area. There's still quite a lot. We're still, we're, we are really late comer, uh, late bloomer in terms of the, uh, in terms of the, uh, what we're, what we're seeing in the region. You know, we are. We are not up there, and there's so many things that we still have to do. And we wish you all the very best, and thank you very much for spending time with us. Okay. Okay. So, thank you.